Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Peace and Justice Studies Association 2020. Um, this is our polarization uh, chapter of a three month long conference where we focused on restorative justice, narrative and storytelling. And this month in November, we're focusing on polarization. Um, today we have Christopher Smithmeyer and Jameson Lingle joining us. And um, our topic for today is security and conflict in a polarized climate. And um, if you are not yet a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, I encourage you to pursue membership. You can check out our website. We're an academic association that provides scholars, students, and activists with insights in peace and justice studies. Um, so our, our membership gives you access to a host of different opportunities, job opportunities, fellowship opportunities, funding opportunities, and connection with other scholars in the field. So I, I encourage you all to pursue that. Um, to start today, uh, Christopher Smithmeyer is going to get us started, and I'm going to turn the um, spotlight over to him, and we'll um, give each presenter about 20 minutes to present. We, we don't have a, that's not, if you go over, we've got time to do that. You can go up to 30 minutes since our third presenter didn't show up. And then we'll have a chance at the end for questions. So if any of the attendees want to um, have a question, you can save it up for the end or post it in the chat as you wish. So thank you again for all being here. And Christopher, thanks for starting us off. Oh, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, First, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for um, having me. That's uh, one of the great things. Whenever groups like yours put things together like this, it gives people a chance to talk about how this kind of polarization in the world is really problematic. And sometimes with the media and what we see on the political left and right, we kind of feel like we're alone in the middle where things are normal and we don't hate our neighbors and we don't care if it's a Trump sign or a Biden sign in their yard, we're still friends. And um, whenever people get a chance to hear something like this and get to hear that, hey, everybody out there is not crazy, it kind of brings us back to the center. And it's really a place that not only our country, but the world needs to see right now is that, hey, people are getting along and people are working together. <clears throat> so as Amanda said, my name is uh, Dr. Christopher smith -Meyer. I'm the Vice President of International Affairs at Brave Online Conflict Management. We're a global consortium of conflict management professionals that works to bring conflict education and access to justice to people around the world. Um, luckily for you guys, that's not what I'm talking on tonight because it's um, that's a very weird, deep subject that a lot of people don't like to hear about. Tonight, I'm gonna be talking about um, polarization within the neo-dialectic model, <coughs> which sounds really boring, but it's something that pretty much everybody can understand because it brings people in together and it shows us that this whole, you have to be either on the black or white of an issue isn't a real thing. It's just something that people want people fighting over because people make money off of it. And a lot of people make a lot of money off of wars, off of internal conflicts and off of people just hating each other because hate is easy to make money off of, love is not. <clears throat> I also want to apologize if you see me popping um, lozenges um i am just coming off of the wonderful crisis of 2020 so um i do have to pop these from time to time to keep my voice strong enough but um so let's get right into it with the main concept that we're dealing with with dialectics is you have a thesis and an antithesis and as you look at this as you look at the basic i'm talking 1800s some 1700s dialectic models you're looking at these two concepts that are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Now, these are theoretical concepts. These are not naturally occurring things. These are things people put together in their minds and use for theory. And that's where they're supposed to be. What we're facing right now is a world where people are taking these theoretical concepts and <coughs> excuse me, they're turning them into realities and positions that you have to be involved with. So for those of you that don't know, the traditional dialectic model, which is called the Hegelian dialectic, is based on the idea that there is a thesis and an antithesis, which can then have three outcomes when they are brought together, when people look at the two different differing ideas. The first is annihilation. That is whenever the thesis 
and the antithesis are so diametrically opposed that whenever their elements are brought together, <coughs> they functionally destroy each other. Like it destroys all elements, that it's one of those basic things. I hate the other side so badly that I am willing to destroy myself to ensure that they are destroyed. It's called a necrosymbiotic relationship where both sides only exist because they hate the other side so much. Now, as you can guess, this is an extremely unhealthy situation that we see in the world today. Whenever people are so against the other side that they're willing to destroy themselves. <clears throat> and we see this in uh, religious radicalism. We see this in political radicalism. This is why radicalism is such a problem. Whenever people put themselves in a category where their own life becomes so inconsequential that they're willing to destroy themselves to injure the other side. So annihilation is something that we want to make sure that we move away from. The next element of things that can come up is called synthesis. Now, this is what most commonly happens in a dialectic. <clears throat> you have the radical ideas on one side. You have the radical ideas on the other side. People talk them out, and they try to find the good elements and get rid of the bad elements and try to come to a solution. Now, this is where a lot of people need to come together in the world and say, hey, I disagree with you, but we're still friends. That's really what you want to see with synthesis. This is what you want to see in the theoretical elements of synthesis. Because when we do this, we move away from these points, these opposite ends of the spectrum, and we move in towards a middle. And that's where most of us are in this moderate middle that isn't out there for hate, isn't out there for anger. The third result that can come from a traditional dialectic model is called synergy. And this is where we really want to be. This is where people work together. They look at what's bad about these polar opposites and then find common ground in the middle from which to build something better. This is the sum is better than the whole of its parts. So it becomes together, we make more, we expand the pie, all those things that you're classically used to hearing in colleges bring it together and we make a better situation and we try to help people be more effective. So that's the traditional dialectic model. That's what <coughs> we've been working on for a couple hundred years now and looking at how we deal with theoretical opposites. The problem that we're seeing today is that the internet is giving us more access to each other and it gives us more access to who we are because whether you're in an internet situation where you're in an echo chamber or whether you're in an internet situation where you're talking to people and learning new things, you're defining yourself by where you're frequenting online, where you're getting your information from, what social media networks you're using and who you communicate with in those social media networks. You're also entering into the digital age. <clears throat> and the irony, the huge irony of this is that the digital age, which is completely made up of ones and zeros, moves well beyond the traditional dialectic model of just having those two goalposts because there is so much more and so many more opinions you can have out there that you don't have to be forced into those two specific areas now for those of you that have read any of my work on quadrilectics it's a basically a dialectic model with a second dialectic now the dialectic model that i worked with was the marxist dialectic i'm not a big fan of marx so don't expect me to start spouting communist information or anything like that or even any of the Frederick Engels type stuff. What I was looking at was that in the dialectic you have basically anarchy and communism, absolute individualism versus absolute <clears throat> societalism. And when I was working through this process, you looked at it and it said that doesn't cover everything. And nothing, everything doesn't fall on that spectrum. There are things that fall outside the spectrum. And whenever we did this, and whenever my team went through the research, we realized that there was a second dialectic that crossed basically at capitalism, because it was the lowest common denominator in the system, where it crossed where there was corporatism, wrought corporatism, which um, if you guys know the extreme form of that is called plutocracy. And on the other side, you have what's called communalism, which is basically the biblical um, system of uh, everybody according to their ability and they take according to their needs. So <clears throat> whenever you have this multiple outlaw or 
multiple polar model. What it does is it gives people the ability to fall anywhere on basically a 3D grid or a 4D grid if you look at it through a temporal lens. And in this age of polarization, in this age of challenges, what you're finding is that people are more likely to polarize on intermittent issues than they are to polarize on global issues. And that is something that's a lot more challenging because whenever you um, had World War II, you were either a fascist or you were a capitalist or you were um, a Bolshevik communist. <clears throat> those were the big groups. And if you didn't fit into one of those groups, nobody really cared what you fit into because you really didn't have an opportunity to connect with people because if you were in a capitalist country like the United States and you decided you were a communist or a fascist, you were probably isolated or arrested. Likewise, in the USSR or in the Axis powers, if you didn't fall into the right ideology, you didn't have the ability to connect with other people because people would turn you in and you were separated, you were polarized. Now, in the modern era, anybody out there that holds a position can likely find that um, you can find somebody that follows the same position as you. And this becomes a very interesting development in the system because to be polarized and to be dedicated to a system, you used to have to be a radical on the fringes. Now you can be a radical towards the middle. And it becomes challenging because we don't know how to deal with that. It is a new evolution based on the social media spaces because <clears throat> if I am a firm believer that in right to life against owning guns, that taxes should only be paid on income tax and um, that everybody should have to have a dog in their cat in their house and the cats are evil. Completely not my social makeup, but I can probably go out there and find at least five groups that fall into those categories. And some of those people in those groups are going to be the people that were hardcore enough to create a social media page, a website on that category. Now, of course, in that situation, I mean, yeah, those those arguments can be annoying or problematic for people. But whenever you start looking for people that believe a very specific issue and they use that ability to polarize people and say, well, you either <coughs> agree with me or you agree with something else. Um, I'm sure you guys have all dealt with it in the uh, uh, recent presidential election. If you're sitting there talking to somebody and you put out their political position um, and they say, well, oh, you obviously agree with President Trump or you obviously agree with Joe Biden. And that might not be what you believe in because both candidates had a multitude of different issues that you could agree with them on or disagree with them on. And there were several other third party candidates that they've already pigeonholed you into either agreeing with them or not agreeing with them based on one issue. And <clears throat> what we need to do as a society is start to realize that people are a little bit more dynamic than one issue. I may have my personal beliefs on abortion, gun rights, taxes, any of these situations, dogs and cats, but that's what makes up me as a person. And you might have completely different or matching beliefs on some of those issues and against some of those issues. And that's what makes you an individual. And in society, we've got to get away from this ability to say, oh, well, you believe in gun rights. That means that you, you hate women's rights. You don't like people of color. And you think that the United States should invade every country. And it's not the truth. Very few people believe extreme beliefs like that. But we're falling into this system where people get pigeonholed because of that. And that brings me towards the end of what I'm going to say, because what we're seeing as the echo chambers become uh, more concrete, we saw the Facebook exodus last Saturday, um, anger, fear, and hate have become virtues. And they're not real virtues. They're never going to be real virtues, but society is allowing them to be virtues and whenever we do this vices are much easier to weaponize 
than actual virtues. If you love somebody, people are going to have a hard time exploiting you to make money off of that. If you truly um, care about the poor, people are going to have a hard time exploiting you to do that. Now, there are people out there that do that, but it's harder to do. However, if you hate Joe Biden or Donald Trump, it is very easy for people to get you to open up your pocketbook to give money to the other candidate. If you're afraid of COVID for your family and your community, it's very easy for scammers to call you and say, hey, this is the nurses union or hey, this is doctors against COVID and try to get you to open your wallets and give them money. And if you're mad, anger is the easiest one to exploit. And we're bringing people to the point that these things are okay. They're like, we had months of protests where most, it was mostly peaceful but there were buildings being destroyed and people were being let off the hook for that. That's not right. And it's not proper. It, it even happened some in our neighborhood where people were like attacking people's houses at night. That's not okay. Though the rule of law has to stay in place and we need to move away from um, virtuification of these vices and start to work back towards what, like I said, the middle where people, you don't have to be put into these polar categories. You can be allowed to be opinionated and not hate your neighbor. So <clears throat> as we deal with this, we need to get people back more to looking at grad gradations, at looking at how they can be working together and be part of a community and still have their own individual elements. Because um, I know this is very cliche, but our diversity is what makes us stronger. The more differing opinions we have that people can back up, that they can defend and they can discuss like civilized human beings, the better our country and the better our world will be. Because humanity moves forward because of new ideas. It is not held back because of new ideas. Another issue, um, it was one of the things that I had the privilege to talk with Amanda a little bit about before we started this session, is we also need to get more travel out there once this it becomes safe to travel again. Because the more we are going around and the more we are meeting people and talking to people, the more we see that people are made up of more than just one issue. And that gives us the ability to work together and to move beyond this echo chamber that COVID has really created as we've been stuck in our homes and really isolated within our own very small communities right now. And finally, we need to step out of our shells and say, maybe we do need help working together. Maybe we do need professionals to come in, um, be the adults in the room in Washington and other capitals around the world where people have become so caught up in the echo chambers that they think regardless of whether they're on the left or the right that whatever they do is gospel and everybody else just has to put up with it and have professionals come in be the adults in the room say your behavior is completely unacceptable sit down work together and help the people that need the help during this crisis get the help they need put the political pandering aside and be the representatives that people have elected you to be. And it, may, it might be time for that. It might be time for us to actually hold our representatives accountable and say, we're tired of the hate, we're tired of the anger. We want a world where we can love our neighbor because we have to live with them. The people in Washington and the people in the capitals around the world don't have to live with our neighbors, we do. So um, that'll wrap me up for my section. Um, I turn it back over to Amanda. Great, thank you, Christopher. That was that was a very informative orientation to dialectic models and um, sort of the strategies that we need to employ to move forward toward um, greater understanding. I appreciate appreciate that, and I'm sure we'll have some good questions for you at the end. Um, again, for those of you in attendance, if you want to put any questions in the chat to keep your thoughts. Um, straight, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, we'll have a chance to ask questions at the at the end of our session. Jameson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to share my screen now. Um, 
All right. Um, so thank you for being a part of this panel on um, security and conflict in a polarized climate. I, um, I have a feeling that security and conflict in a polarized climate is gonna be something that affects our lives and our research uh, for the next few decades. And I'm of this mindset um, because of the theoretical uh, framework I'm gonna be talking about today. I have the, I, I kind of come from the perspective that I, I'm pretty sure that things are going to get worse before they start to get better. But as conflict researchers and practitioners, we have an understanding um, and at times a responsibility to explain to the general public and sometimes to our clients that conflict uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Conflict doesn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, conflict, as we know, um, sometimes leads to really good thing. And oftentimes conflict is a critical component uh, for making good change happen. <clears throat> so conflict isn't, it itself isn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it's an opportunity. And what determines if that conflict evolves into something good or bad is the way in which we choose or we do engage that conflict. And so the question becomes, why does some conflict evolve into something good while other conflict evolves into something bad? And why is some good conflict simply, okay, great, there's a resolution and we move on with our lives all the way to a transformative experience that changes someone's um, life. Uh, and on the flip side of that, why is some conflict uh, simply dysfunctional while other bad conflict uh, becomes absolutely destructive? The main argument that I'm gonna be making uh, today is I try try to explain some dynamics theory is that the primary mechanism that separates good conflict, good conflict from bad conflict is the cognitive activation of zero sum thinking, right? So the application of zero sum thinking in a conflict situation. That this happens depending on the interaction between structural and psychological factors. And that this claim is universal and equally true across all fields of conflict research. Um, so this theory building and this research and modeling that I'm gonna be presenting today as some dynamics is a generalizable theory of conflict. Um, meaning that I believe that this theory of conflict and model applies to interpersonal, community, organizational, international, intercultural conflict, research analysis and engagement. And um, when I started this research as part of my master's thesis, I wanted to have a deeper understanding of aspects of conflict that were universal across the spectrum of conflict research. Because the literature tends to split conflict research into different isolated categories, really what I wanted to do is find a thread um, that could go through these different silos and hopefully tie them together. And the beautiful thing about uh, zero-sum thinking well, it's not really beautiful, but um, the thing about zero-sum thinking is that in all conflict literature that I'm familiar with, uh, conflict can be approached as cooperatively or competitively. Now, a zero-sum situation is strictly competitive, so zero-sum thinking then is thinking within the context of a zero-sum situation. So let's get into, uh, oh, did I just, I'm on the wrong slide. There we go already. Oh, no, I'm not. All right, methods. So for the last almost two years, um, I've been reading and synthesizing the literature on zero-sum thinking from psychology, economics, sociology, anthropology, and political science. I've been looking for themes and patterns and then synthesizing that research with literature from the field of conflict. I've been developing case studies and modeling and designing research um, methods to test some of these ideas. Um, and this presentation is also part of that process because I'm hoping that you as uh, conflict researchers or practitioners uh, can engage with me on this and really challenge me as well. I wanna know if, if any of this, uh, some of it's not gonna make sense because theory building is, is trying to 
explain something that doesn't, doesn't have language yet, right? But what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? What can, uh, what do you think I got wrong? And what do you specifically think maybe I got wrong? Um, what could apply to your research or what do you think absolutely could not apply to your own research? Uh, so I'm, I, if you're interested at all, I, I really do encourage you to challenge me on any aspect of this. Um, so let's get into some dynamics. Uh, there are three primary claims that I'm gonna be making today. And actually I'm gonna focus on the information in this, but okay. Some dynamics theory asserts that one, the cognitive activation of zero sum thinking in a conflict situation is the primary mechanism that determines whether and to what degree an individual or group will be able to utilize constructive, functional, dysfunctional, or destructive conflict engagement strategies. The fluidity of this mechanism is dependent upon the interactive effects of three core variables, situational or structural scarcity beliefs, situ situational or structural entitlement beliefs, and something called belief in zero-sum games, which is a social axiom and worldview. And three, this mechanism is universal and observable across all sectors of conflict research. Essentially what I'm arguing is that zero-sum thinking is the sole mechanism that determines if the conflict is engaged in a way that leads to what I, good conflict or bad conflict. And the degrees of zero-sum thinking is directly correlated with just how good or how bad that conflict engagement becomes. I'm arguing that all other variables, social, structural, psychological, cultural, physiological, communication, history, rhetoric, that the intervention methods that we research and we study and we practice, that those influence the, the dynamics of a conflict situation, depending on how they influence um, this cognitive heuristic inside our brain that manages zero sum thinking. So uh, what is zero-sum thinking? Where does it come from? How does it work? And what does it do? So before I can talk about zero-sum thinking, I need to explain what a zero-sum situation is. A zero-sum situation is any situation in which X's losses are Y's gains and Y's losses are X's gains. Um, so because any gains made by one party are losses for the other, nobody can act in their own interest without acting against the interests uh, of another party. So an example was in the US before 1980s, um, the United States had a fault divorce process where one person would win and one person would lose uh, depending on who was at fault. And then during the 80s, they moved to a different process, um, which was not necessarily zero sum. So as opposed to a zero sum situation, you can have um, positive sum situations, which are mutually beneficial, negative sum situations, which are mutually destructive, uh, or outcomes that are simply independent from one another. And so zero sum thinking then is thinking within the context of a zero sum situation. And here's the thing about zero sum thinking, it can happen and be applied to a situation, whether in fact that situation is zero sum. So um, that makes uh, zero sum thinking a cognitive heuristic or a bias that is evolved to help us interpret com complex situations quickly and simply without a complex analysis. So as a cognitive heuristic, we approach a conflict situation with limited and incomplete information and analysis uh, it's as much of a like a gut check or a feeling that influences the way that we interpret conflict as it is anything else. And it's kind of like a light switch that can be turned on or turned off depending on a number of different variables. As a cognitive bias, its application is fluid and it can be applied to, oh, it can be applied to both material as well as abstract resources perceived to be limited and distributable. Um, it's believed that this evolved originally from intrapersonal or intra-group competition and then later continued to evolve to uh, influence our perception during intergroup competition. So you can imagine in a situation involving intra-group competition, 
at times when resources were regularly limited, abstract resources such as status or love or friendship could be equally as important as material resources such as food or water because we might distribute resources depending on where we stand within the social hierarchy of our group. Mm, that's better, my mouth is so dry right now. All right, um, so as a cognitive bias evolved for um, self-preservation when considering resource allocations at, and um, that are both material and abstract resources or symbolic resources, zero-sum thinking as a cognitive heuristic can be applied to anything in which we assign a weighted value to, particularly things that we perceive as important to our short or long-term survival. And it doesn't matter if the resource in question is material or abstract, whether the resource truly is zero-sum or false, falsely perceived to be that way, our behavior, our thinking, our decision-making, and our actions uh, fundamentally follow the same pattern and are expressed the same way. And so, for example, the literature, the research has shown these patterns, um, including on research that's considering uh, academic grades, political ideology, immigration, economic money exchanges, social status, social justice, group membership, romantic beliefs, and, and more. And so um, there are two psychological bases of zero, that cause zero-sum thinking, scarcity beliefs and entitlement beliefs. Scarcity beliefs occur in any situation when resources are perceived important, limited, and in competition. Zero-sum thinking is a natural response to uh, scarce important resources because as resources are, are um, are becoming even more limited, we're thinking about the allocation of a scarce resource, right? So we become prepared to act, to preserve our life. Um, entitlement, on the other hand, suggests that one has the exclusive right to or more of a resource than others. And as such, any person or group who believe they are both entitled to and in competition over a resource can interpret any amount less than the total as a loss um, and should perceive that the gains of others equals a, a, a reduced share of their own. As a cognitive bias, the situational application of zero-sum thinking is consistently seen to be asymmetrical or unidirectional. That is, there's a much stronger chance of applying zero-sum thinking when considering your own losses rather than your own gains. Um, and over the, the, uh, the literature over the past uh, several decades, what it shows is that situationally high status individuals or individuals with a situational advantage are more likely to apply zero-sum thinking or bias when they perceive their relative status or advantage is endangered. So this is consistent with the prospects of um, white people in the United States with men, um, but it's seen consistently in any dominant in-group or person with a situationally relative high status. And that includes when I talked about grades earlier, students that have a higher grade than, than other kids are more likely to apply this, um, this cognitive functioning, whether or not it truly is zero sum. This is a great example of entitlement beliefs inducing zero sum thinking from a 2010 study by Norton and Summers showing that whites in the US were starting to see racial discrimination as a zero sum game in which they are now losing. So you can see the difference um, in, in about 2010, um, whites now saw, as did they perceive discrimination against black people um, to go down, they perceive discrimination against white people to go up. Whereas if you're, that's that asymmetrical thing, right? Whereas um, black people in the United States, they did perceive discrimination to go down, but they didn't to the same degree see that uh, discrimination against white people was going up. So now while there are uh, two psychological bases of zero sum thinking, uh, some dynamics theory has categorized three um, different variables that induce or people can experience zero sum thinking through. 
So structural scarcity beliefs, structural entitlement beliefs. And um, the third is belief in zero sum gains. Um, so structural scarcity beliefs and structural entitlement beliefs are dependent on situational and structural factors, whereas belief in zero sum game is a generalized cognitive bias. Um, that people can experience. And what it does is it makes it so every, they interpret everything in their life um, to be a zero sum game or more likely to be a zero sum game. And as we'll get into a little bit later, there are a lot of negative consequences of that. So what does it do? Ultimately, when this light switch is turned on, zero-sum thinking has been shown to enhance racism, prejudice, hostility, and competitiveness while stifling cooperation and um, collaboration. Um, at the national level, nations that have a higher collective belief in zero-sum games is correlated with higher military spending and lower civil liberties. Individuals with a higher belief in zero-sum game than the national norm have a tendency to view themselves as losers in social exchanges. They have higher levels of anxiety and depression and lower levels of satisfaction um, in life. When given an opportunity to make a decision, participants experiencing zero-sum thinking take or support actions that reduce the ability for others to compete while enhancing oneself or their group's ability to compete within those situations. And they simultaneously justify those actions. It creates a, a rationalization for uh, prejudicial and discriminatory behavior. So zero sum thinking leads to bad conflict engagement strategies. Now, sometimes situations are in fact zero sum and zero sum thinking then is sometimes practical or rational. It's usually not. We as conflict researchers and practitioners understand that, that most conflicts are not, or that they don't have to be zero sum, that we can transform conflict and conflict transformation has the power to transform people and communities. But I argue here that zero sum thinking, the cognitive activation of zero sum thinking, the application of zero sum thinking is the primary mechanism that determines whether an individual or group will be able to engage a conflict in a way that leads to good outcomes or bad outcomes. Um, not just that though, it also determines just how good or how bad those conflict engagement strategies um, become. So zero sum thinking has been examined situationally as a cognitive bias or as a social axiom. And while these approaches are all valuable and insightful for particular questions and contribute to the growing body of literature and understanding of zero-sum thinking, a conflict research perspective suggests that none of these approaches in isolation can cultivate a holistic understanding of any conflict dynamic. So some dynamics theory claims that while all three of these variables in and of themselves can flip on that light switch to activate zero-sum thinking, um, no study, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, while these can do it together, when they act together, they, can, they have the opportunity to compound. So when someone has high situational scarcity beliefs and high entitlement beliefs or a high belief in zero sum game, it increases um, the, the method of conflict. And we know that the three variables interact in a lot of different ways, but while research has shown that some of the interactions between these variables exist, no studies have examined how these variables, when more than one is present, compound. Um, so with that being said, I think we should consider the notion of what I call, this is based off of Foster's work, um, a privileged peasant mindset. That is an individual or a group's cognitive functioning when they experience simultaneous uh, perceptions of high levels of relative scarcity and yet maintain a privileged status within or because of their group membership situationally or within their larger society. And I think uh, as an example, I think this phenomenon may be consistent with the fact that um, 
Hitler and the Nazi party were able to move from 2.6% of the electorate um, in May of 1928 to 37% in July of 1932. It's largely known that this has to do with the economic crash that was particularly bad for uh, Germany because of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and I argue that this may have been in part due to the psychological underpinnings of zero-sum thinking that allowed for Nazi rhetoric born of entitlement beliefs to connect with the German population when they experienced a dramatic spike in scarcity beliefs as a result of economic realities. Um, so I argue that the entitlement beliefs of the Nazi party likely connected to the scarcity beliefs of the general public through a shared cognitive activation of zero sum thinking. So within the context of sum dynamics theory, uh, constructive and functional conflict engagement strategies are both the result of cooperative approaches to conflict engagement, while dysfunctional and destructive conflict engagement strategies are the result of competitive approaches to conflict engagement. Um, so the conceptualization phase of some dynamics theory imagines um, a spectrum. A lot of times conflict researchers in their writing, they, just, they, they use the term constructive or destructive or functional or dysfunctional. Sometimes they're interchangeable. Um, I view those things on a spectrum. Um, and, and I argue that the degree of conflict engagement, how good or how bad it is may be directly tied to the degree of zero sum thinking that is experienced by the parties involved in a conflict. Um, so earlier I asked you to think of the cognitive activation of zero sum thinking as a light switch that can be turned on or turned off inside the brain. Uh, now I'm suggesting you imagine that light switch with a dimmer that can be pushed up or pushed down. So for simplicity, imagine that uh, structural scarcity beliefs or structural entitlement beliefs or belief in zero sum game could all be measured separately on a scale of zero through 10, zero being the lowest unit of measurement and 10 being the highest unit of measurement for each separate variable. And then some dynamics theory posits that together there may be a total variable scale of zero through 30. Again, for simplicity, let's imagine that the cognitive activation of zero sum thinking occurs when there is a score of six. Every point below six um, then becomes functional or constructive conflict engagement while every point from six through 30 um, is dysfunctional or destructive and the higher the points, the, the more destructive um, that conflict will be. Uh, let me go back here. So I'm arguing two things. These variables can be measured independently when I talk about structural scarcity beliefs, structural entitlement beliefs, and belief in zero sum game, these can be measured um, independently of each other and they can all cause zero sum thinking. Um, and the measurable, and these variables can be measured independently, but together, and that the measurable score uh, can predict how people choose to engage a conflict situation. So, um, Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just go with this. Um, as, a, as a model for conflict analysis, um, this is like a super simplified version of the operationalization of this. But essentially what I'm arguing is that if you're analyzing a conflict, the first step is to identify the resources being valued in the conflict, whether those are material or abstract. Uh, analyze the situation or system to understand if the valued resources are scarce or if there is an applied cognitive bias or both. And so they can be scarce for different reasons, right? So early human hunter gatherers experienced um, scarcity of food and all the time because of natural resource limitations. Today, I think it's one out of eight Americans experience food scarcity while we, well, it's like 20% uh, or 40% of all food produced in the United States is, uh, thrown out to waste. So identify if the true scarcity is resource limitations or if it's structural or if it's a cognitive bias. If it's a cognitive bias, um, is that situational or is it is it um, a global, is it 
generalizable cognitive bias. You can analyze that if they if you can't have them take the score, you can have you can analyze a country or a group based off of their hierarchical beliefs or collective beliefs um, or their GDP or whatever the equivalent of that is. And then look at how do cultural norms, social uh, societal factors and related attitudes interact with that dynamic and then explore appropriate interventions responsive to step one through four. And there are a number of interventions that have been shown already uh, to be successful depending on the situation. Uh, and then there's a lot that are theorized to be effective as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip that and go to a thank you to the Peace, Justice and Studies Association. And uh, thank you for watching and I will leave it right there. And then, yeah. Great, thank you, Jameson. If you can um, stop sharing screen again. Yeah. Um, the, it disappeared. <laughs> Is it at the bottom under share screen? If you push the bottom dashboard. Oh, there it is. Hold on. Okay, there we go. All right, got it, got it, got it. There we go. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, thank you. Wow, both really interesting presentations. Um, I'm not sure, I don't see any questions in the chat and I, you know, I can toss a few questions into the conversation and, and then maybe we can um, have it be more of a conversation than a Q and A just yeah. given the numbers. Um, yeah. One of the, the questions that I have for you, Jameson, or I should give you a break and get my question for um, Christopher. Um, So I'm thinking about um, these different polar models that you were talking about and um, working toward the middle. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what the, um, are there some strategies for how you move people from radical perspectives to a more centrist stance or into like, what are the variables that you, um, believe, I know you spoke about international exchange as being a key um, mechanism to bringing people away from radicalized um, belief structures, but what are some other mechanisms, even within our own country, within our own families, as the holidays approach, where we might be able to um, move into a more um, synergistic um, uh, model of um, understanding? Um. <coughs> Well, one thing that I always like to teach people, especially whenever I'm doing like intro conflict classes is um, radicalism and anger take energy. And that's one of the first things that you have to do is remove the agitating factor. So um, <clears throat> if I was conservative and I wanted to be proud that I was conservative and go to a Thanksgiving party and not cause a problem, I wouldn't wear a make America great again hat because like, and I, I mean, if you guys look at my writing, I'm conservative. Everybody knows that. So I'm not outing myself or anything like that, but there is a place and time for everything. And I have liberal members in my family. I, I, we all have that. That's, that's how people's families are made up. Um, I think that's how God keeps things interesting. And whenever there is something like a MAGA hat or my abortion was fabulous shirt. If somebody wears that to your house, like during Thanksgiving or something, you're more than welcome to ask them, be like, okay, this is Thanksgiving. This is Christmas. This is um, Hanukkah, whatever holiday you're celebrating. This isn't the place for that. We're here as a family. We're here to come here together. We're not here to pick fights with uncle Jim or aunt Sally. We're not here to get <coughs> these arguments out. So the first thing I always tell people, whenever you want to depolarize a situation, any fuel you can take off that fire makes things easier to de-escalate. <coughs> and people that are wearing stuff like that know that they're, they're there to provoke a conversation. Um, one of the things that I see in a bunch of chat rooms all the time is that people, um, they make the joke, my boyfriend told me not to bring up politics at Thanksgiving. And then they have like Trump wine or something like that. 
be on the outlook for things like that for discussion. If somebody brought Trump wine and you know that there's somebody that's very liberal in your family that was going to be offended by that, decant the wine. <laughs> like, if this is something you're really worried about, make sure that you just cut it off. Because no matter how rabid people are, especially when they show up, when they're sober, before they start drinking, <clears throat> they're more willing to be reasonable and have those little things taken off. It's like, okay, like, okay, Uncle Jim, please take your hat off. You know that's going to cause an argument with Aunt Sally. Most people are okay with that because while they want to provoke a conversation, they don't want to be perceived as the bad guy. They want the other person's reaction. And um, I don't know if you guys are big fans of South Park. <coughs> um, I am. I really enjoy their older stuff. And one of the things is called Trevor's Axiom. And I believe it's attributed to them. I don't know of anybody else that's ever come up with this theory, but it says when you're in a social situation, the best way to start a big explosion isn't to be the main part of the argument by yourself, but it's to provoke somebody to say something to you that's so offensive to somebody else, someone else gets in on the attack. <clears throat> and that's what these items do. That's what these... Uh, wearing political signs to your family events you're not doing it because you're the best donald trump supporter best joe biden supporter you're doing it because you want to start a fight and if you call <coughs> i apologize for the coughing if you call somebody out on that normally especially at the beginning of the night whenever you're um Whenever they're coming to your house and everybody's sober, that's a big factor because as it gets later on into the night, they're more likely to fight against it. When everybody's sober, usually they will take the hat off, put a sweater on over the offensive shirt, something that because it's a reasonable request and it is your home and people, the jokes moved far enough at that point. Somebody's noticed that, hey, I'm special. I wore my shirt. Now let's move on to the family stuff. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. That's great. Okay, Jameson. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, do you want, <clears throat> so I have two questions actually. Um, so in there, you, uh, earlier you said that um, that radical uh, radicalism and anger um, are both take a lot of energy, um, and I'm wondering, do you are you saying that as those things are, are, are together or as separate items, first of all. And then second of all, um, you know, it, it's unclear to me if you're suggesting that it's beneficial for that group to not have that fight or if it's beneficial um, or if it is beneficial to have the fight, but you're arguing not to have the fight in a particularly confrontational way? Um, to answer your second question first, um, it is beneficial not to have the fight because in Amanda's example, she's the homeowner for the party and she doesn't want the fight. So it's beneficial for her not to have the fight in her house is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm a person that's against politics and um, family events. So that's just personal um, belief, but um, so what I would be to answer her question where she wants that these constructed, yes, I would say it would be, um, it would be problematic in her event because she doesn't want it and it's her house and, uh, she's the queen of her castle. Um, I'm a big, uh, big castle doctor person. Um, moving to your first question. <clears throat> yes, I believe that radicalism requires energy and I also believe that anger requires energy, but I'm not going to go so far to say is they're the same energy. Um, I have some Canadian friends that are some of the most radical, least angry people in the world. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys deal with the piece of the circle people, really nice people. They are super radical, but I know some of those people do not have an angry bone in their body. Like they're just the nicest positive people army stuff. Um, so to answer your first question, yes, anger requires a lot of energy. Yes, radicalism requires a lot of energy. Is it always the same kind of energy? No. 
Um, the way I like to, um, and they're not necessarily the, connected. That was the no. the main. Oh question. no, they're, they're not, not necessarily always. That, yeah, that's no. what I was. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. And then I, I guess a follow up question. Um, when you're talking about it's better for the parties not to have that fight. Now you use the example of a house party, um, but that symbolically could lead to a bigger part of society. And yes. myself, as someone that is extremely radical i believe myself to be a radical uh though not at all angry um but but people could perceive your argument and and i think the common like if you're on twitter the common argument against what you're saying is like it's really easy for you to say that as a white heterosexual male right Mm -hmm. to not have that you don't need to have that fight right but to have that fight is really the only like the good conflict and the bad conflict some would say I would say the only way to actually have a good conflict is to engage that fight. Now you have to engage that fight, I would argue, cooperatively. Um, but, but I think the idea, of, I'm a little unclear of on what you're saying in terms of it's better for that house party uh, to not have that fight when I think about that in the bigger picture, right? Within the bigger part of society. And so I guess, how would you respond to that, to that argument? Um, <clears throat> one, I am... Um... <clears throat> really uh, interesting way to put this. Um, I think not having arguments at the societal and academic level is one of the dumbest things society can do. Um, I'm a big believer. That's what killed Rome. That's what killed Rome. That's what allowed the rise of, um, that's what happened in Versailles because we can't have the debate of whether the Nazis should have, or the, not the Nazis, the World War I Germans the Weimars should have to pay for everything. We, you weren't allowed to suggest, no, they don't have to pay for anything. And unheralded conflicts are always going to spew disputes. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Without, without running down the privilege argument, because um, there's a whole bunch of um, argument, counter argument that goes down that road. If I don't necessarily believe that the, Um, distaste for having an argument over something always comes from a position of privilege. I think that um, that often that not wanting to have the argument comes from a position of perceived lack of power. And I think it really comes back to Amanda's question because of her question was about her house. And she should have complete control over her house. And I don't know how rowdy her family gets. I mean, her family could get really rowdy, but she might not want to have the argument because not because she wants to stifle somebody's argument, but because she doesn't want drunk Uncle Joe and drunk drunk Uncle Bob throwing fists in their living room. Um, So it's really a judgment situation. Now, I'm um, I've got on stages around the world and argued with people. Um, I've actually had guns pointed at my head after I've given a speech. Um, when I spoke at a, uh, APEC in 2017, um, I had members of the uh, Vietnamese Communist Party standing over me with guns for the rest of my trip because I said some stuff that, um, even though it was in the approved speech, uh, one of the censors missed. <clears throat> so I'm a huge believer in putting stuff out there, even if you don't like to see it. I can't stand Alex Jones. But I'm one of those people, I will die for his right to stand up there and say his back crap crazy, whatever he's standing up there saying. Um, the only person that I don't really say that I would fight for them to say anything they want is whenever somebody's racist, like uh, Milo. I, I won't give him a platform to speak on um, because I don't agree with that. Not that I don't agree with him being allowed to talk. It's just there's some things that are nonsense. And with that... Um, I really think the discussion needs to be held and discussions need to be held in family units. But I really think the better family event to have the discussion at rather than Thanksgiving or Christmas would be the 4th of July, Labor Day, um, Veterans Day. One of the days where we're talking about our freedoms and why we have our freedoms and why we should continue to have our freedoms as opposed to a day that's about bringing family together over love because if you if it's something that you know people are going to fight over save that for the freedom holidays because um 
you have a whole lot better chance of making up over the beers than you do up over a turkey because turkey legs are really sharp. I'd like to just interject here. Thank you both for your questions and for your answers. And I think that um, one of the things in the scope of polarization that's so important for us to recognize is that part of our part of the reason we're polarized is because of a lack of capacity for debate and conversation and argument that's constructive. And so both of you have provided us with some excellent theoretical models for understanding why and how things either don't ever get to the point of argument or um, possibly do, and then, you know, help to shift that sense of polarization. Um, but this is, as, as Tan and Rebecca know, because they're in my class this term, we've been talking a lot about the necessity for deliberation and that, you know, in a perfect world, we would recognize that that is the role of higher education is to teach those skills of deliberation, but we're in such a highly volatile climate right now of polarization that we don't necessarily get those skills just to, to the, into the minds of, of our students. Um, in ways that are effective. And we ourselves are subject to some of the polarization and radicalization that keeps us from being able to engage constructively into, in, in debate and deliberation. I wanna ask Jameson a question um, around um, zero sum thinking and this notion that zero sum thinking necessitates bad conflict because I think um, that's true for the losers of the contest, but not necessarily the winners. And I think that's one of the ways that it makes it difficult for us to um, counter zero sum thinking is because those who win and competitive conflict engagement in general, people who have a lot of privilege or who have a lot of power, who wield a lot of power, um, believe that that is a fair contest. And so I don't know how that fits necessarily into um, scarcity, I suppose it's an entitlement. I suppose that's what the entitlement bias is, but I just wonder how you, um, what your justification is for calling it a bad conflict when there are certainly, you know, 50% of people who go into zero sum thinking end up victorious. Oh, you're muted, Thank sorry. You. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I kind of have two parts to it. To, to that answer. I, I think as a, as a mediator that practices interest-based negotiation and interest-based mediation, I would argue um, that yes, that person is gonna be happy. The winner of that situation is going to be happy. Um, and they are a winner and the other person is a loser. Um, however, we know through mediation that, that both parties can have their interests met and both parties can be winners, right? And as such, if you are a part of a group, an intra-group competition, if you're a part of a community with someone, um, it's better for that community, I would argue, if you have uh, an outcome in which both parties win rather than one party wins or one party loses. Um, now, if you're the winner and you support that, obviously I, I would argue that that's based off entitlement beliefs where you believe that you are entitled to all or more of a resource that is a part of a perceived pie. Um, and, and I, this does tie into mediation because I, I do think, um, part of this goes into like, um, you know, we, we have a government system and a legal system of rights. And before it was a rights-based system, it was a power-based system. And I, my radicalism is I believe that we're in the future when we have a revolution, the next system of governance and the next system of law should be interest-based, right? And that's starting to happen in law a little bit, um, with the popularization of mediation. It's starting to happen in the business world with dispute system design. Um, but the opportunity is there. And, and, I, and I, I think um, that addresses both the entitlement beliefs and the scarcity beliefs um, together. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I have one more question. And that is um, in a world where we have such um, phenomenally uh, huge discrepancies between haves and have nots. What are some ways to effectively counter particularly scarcity, but also entitlement um, ideation when you are trying to bring people into shared space? And it speaks to also just in mediation, the discrepancies of power, like what are some mechanisms for addressing that? Um, yeah, and, and um, so I'm, I'm actually hoping to do a PhD where I study this and, and study particularly using interest-based mediation 
as a model for this because some of uh, the research that has shown um, success in reducing zero sum beliefs um, have been based around providing information on the on the non-zero sumness of a situation, right? If people are in a perceived conflict, they perceive it to be zero sum. Once they are provided information showing that that situation is in fact not zero sum, it has, it can reduce that. Um, so one study did this with perceptions on immigrants um, with, with participants from the United States and Canada. And they found that for a lot of people that reduced their zero sum thinking. However, there was a significant uh, portion of that group um, where it actually made their zero sum beliefs worse. And the reason this was th those people that experienced that also had a high, what is it? A, um, social dominance orientation. And so what was effective for reducing their zero sum beliefs actually were provisions were, were explaining or provisions that made like a, it changed the perspective of who was a part of your in-group and who was a part of your out-group. So what it did is it took their cultural roots and showed the commonalities between their cultural roots with the commonalities between uh, an immigrant, right? You're both coming from the same place. In the, if you're in the United States or Canada, you're all immigrants. Your family came here for these reasons. And so this kind of like um, perceptual manipulation of who is your in-group or who is your out-group can be manipulated. Um, and there's a study showing we can belong to a lot of different in-groups, right? Who we identify as part of our in-group is very fluid. Um, I could be mad at Christopher because he's a conservative, but maybe we both like the Packers. And then it's like, all right, we're on the same team on Sunday. So, so um, in-group, out-group dynamics are, are a big part of that. And so how do you challenge uh, in-group, out-group uh, perception? So I'm an advocate of like um, operationalizing intersectionality and showing the, the, the intersections of oppression, right? So how different groups are, are all oppressed um, and showing that commonality, I think that's a technique. <clears throat> and I think interest-based negotiation um, or cognitive behavioral therapy have potential to provide that information on the non-zero sumness of a situation or um, narrative mediation could challenge people's perception of in-group, out-group dynamics. Um, and so, I, yeah, I see a lot of it. On the other hand, a lot of it's going to have to be structural, right? You can't just explain to someone something is not zero sum when structurally it is. Uh, economists that study zero sum thinking are the absolute worst because they, they love to say, you know, theoretically economics is not a zero sum situation. But <laughs> there's a lot of examples of in practice, in certain situations, it is a zero sum situation. And so there's a great study called uh, Conditions to Thrive that's shown since the 1950s to today, the amount of hours, the amount of weeks a, a family of four needs to work um, over a one year period to have a condition to thrive, a basic standard, quality standard of living. It used to be like three or four weeks short of a year. And now it's like three or four days past a year. And this has changed over time. So people are, when they consider how they grew up and how their, 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 they, their parents were, how their parents' security was, economic security was, um, the perception of relative scarcity is going up. Whether that's true or not, um, I think there are a lot of structural problems there. So increasing the pie of the top 1% globally, um, I think is gonna have negative effects, whether it does or not towards everybody else, the perception has an influence. So I think there are structural factors too, and I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. And what I'm hearing from um, both of you is that the, the task at hand is to create um, opportunities for greater shared reality or um, you know, greater common ground for, um, for divergent perspectives and belief structures. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful um, task for all of us to undertake and certainly one that's necessary to counter polarization in all of its forms. I want to ask if, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. So sorry, Amanda. Oh, sorry. I, I was so, I had to go get a different computer because this is such an interesting and useful uh, conversation because of the pro uh, presentation coming up and my part of it, <laughs> which I'm very stressed out about, by the way. Oh, because, no. Well, because 
we started talking about, well, it first started political polarization, and then it went into how can we have this conversation without talking about Black Lives Matter movement? And anyway, it ended up on my, me to do that. I'm like, wait, I'm a white person here. No, I can't. But then I started thinking, well, because, sorry, I'm just going on and on, but um, I had just come from that seminar from Lewis and Clark, and it was about the uh, pipeline, school to pipeline, to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And as some people that were in a program there were talking and very powerful, very moving, um, just just down to earth um, and laying it on the line talk about how black young, well, it was a young gentleman, black person who said, you know, my life and going through all the, the hardships and struggles of, of, of oppression in my life has not mattered. And I still feel like there's such a long way to feel like it matters. And so I have a question for Christopher. How can it feels so such like a privilege to say, wouldn't this be wonderful if we could all aspire to the synergy level you're talking about? But how how do we get there when that is just a slogan to the, the black community? And, and they just have not seen anything in action, you know, to help bring them in and at the table and talk peacefully amongst each other for everything. How, how, how can we get there? <laughs> excellent, excellent question, Rebecca. Thank you so much for asking it. That, that is a really good question. And um, one of the things that I've always worked with, um, the good news is very rarely when I'm not giving political speeches and stuff like that, and someone asks me that speech, that type of question, do I have to answer it to a person from a minority community? Because usually there's someone there that I've been working with in the, in the community that says, well, if you want to help with this, come here. He's He's been on the ground helping. Like I'm, I've been giving speeches first step act. I've been working with the juvenile court system. Um, I'm glad that Lewis and Clark is having stuff on uh, uh, pipe schools to prison pipeline stuff because that is something we have to stop. And part of the problem that we have is we have this um, like 1820s education system in the United States right now <coughs> where we're basing our school's income off of the uh the property values in the district <clears throat> and that is a very um it's a major problem this is where i get um attacked by teachers unions whenever i get up and give speeches on this as a conservative because i'm not supposed to come out and say this i'm not supposed to, like conservatives aren't supposed to come out and say hey um guess what the millage rate is really dumb the way that it was set up was because farmers had like 20 kids inner city people had like eight kids. So we have this millage where things are based on how much property you live on. And that is how you get billed for your for your kids getting taught. It was a fair system back then. I'll, I'm going to say that's right. <clears throat> now we go from a system where farmers had 20 kids to where farmers are having five kids. People in the cities are having two kids or eight kids. And the number, the amount of money going into the schools is based on the property value where it comes from. And families that tend to have a lot of children tend to have a lower property value, regardless of race. And this sets a foundation for a broken system. <clears throat> and as we, if we're going to work from a position of whether you want to call it privilege, whether you want to call it something else, if people aren't willing to get on the ground and help people i tell people from any community i don't care what community you're from call them out if you have a politician that sits there and talks about how much they're going to do and help black people but they won't get on the ground and help in the inner city communities or they're going to say we're going to help asian people and they won't get in into the small communities in chinatown and koreatown and actually go and help people and show that they're helping then call out their bullshit I don't care if they get a D after their name or an R after their name, just because you signed up for a political card when you were 18 doesn't mean that you got, 
you get all this speciality of being the the voice of the minorities. If you're not on the ground working, go ahead and call them out. And that's um, uh, for, you had mentioned like, what does a person <coughs> that is um, disenchanted by the system do? Um, if they ask you, say, look for a person that's actually helping in the communities because there are people across the country, liberal and conservative, that are in there trying to help. And a lot of the reason we don't hear about them is because they're the wrong color, they're the wrong gender, or they're the wrong um, it crowd to be supported right now. And <clears throat> regardless of who they're sleeping with, what their gender preference, their race, regardless of any of that, if they're actually on the ground making the world a better place, we should be supporting them. Um, whether how we feel about their politics is completely out the window. Now, that is people that are actually helping, not the people that are out there like digging one shovel, shovel full of dirt in a community garden just to get a photo op. It, it's uh, the people that are good when the cameras aren't on. Look oh, for those Rebecca, kind of people. Rebecca, were you were you also looking for some affirmation that you can tackle the concerns of the Black Lives Matter movement or the, well, the, to get people to the table? Right. My angle is going to speak, be um, we we have to recognize our privilege. And Jameson, you you spoke on this. I think about the. Um, privileged peasant, uh, I, I, I kind of that breezed over. I, I didn't have time to absorb all of that, but I, I, I to, sorry, one second. I do have a question regarding that, but to answer Amanda. Um, or don't answer me. You can just bring okay. it up. That's fine. Okay. Well, well also just it, and eat with Christopher that again, I have to say that all sounds nice and yes I, you know speak to our policymakers of course but that's um again it just i know we're not going to solve anything right here but it just again sounds more like slogans we have to have uh support for resources we have to have funding funding um where we we tell say the conservative um politicians this and they say, yes, yes, we'll work on that. Yet they give tax cuts to the wealthy, this trickle down economics business, um, uh, the, 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 um, the industrial um, defense complex, you know, all the money going there. And so it, it's, they, they'll just look at you in the face and say, yes, I, I understand, I, I'm a compassionate person too. But where they funnel the money and the policies that they make show differently. So that's my argument there on that. I just wanted to have a rebuttal. And then also, Jameson, if, if you could speak on that um, privileged peasant theory, part of your theory. Yeah. Um... Actually, the first thing I, before I address the privileged peasant mindset, um, and and I think that is really important. But I, I want to talk about real quick Black Lives Matter in terms of how white people respond to Black Lives Matter. Okay. You probably remember when when this first became a part of the national dialogue, the general response from most white people um, was all lives matter. Right? It was all lives matter. Like my dad, a liberal, well intentioned for him, it was like a reconciliatory response. Like, well, black lives matter, yeah, but all lives matter, right? And then also in my community, there was this lady who spray, uh, pepper sprayed a bunch of teenagers with black lives matter signs outside her car while she yelled, fuck you, all lives matter, right? And so I'm arguing that this is in fact a zero sum response. They are hearing black lives matter. As a what? Is, well, yeah, people are saying Black Lives Matter, but what they are hearing is that white lives don't matter or white lives matter less, right? They view the, the because of their advantage, the, because of the situational historical advantage that they have, 
they perceive Black Lives Matter as a reduction of the value of non-Black lives. And that's not what it is. It's an affirmation. It's a confirmation of the value of Black lives. But what's being heard is non-Black lives matter less. And so that is that is a, a perfect example of zero-sum thinking, particularly when considering how entitlement beliefs apply to zero-sum thinking. Um, okay. Uh, and so in terms of the privileged peasant mindset, I, I think that it kind of uh, plays into, so there's something called the um, ideal of limited good. It was a, like a 1960s paper by George Foster. He's a, like an anthropologist. And this was before the terminology of zero sum thinking existed. Um, but he studied peasant societies and pe peasant cogn cognition. Uh, and so he showed that it doesn't matter if it was in Latin America or Asia or in Europe, peasants had some of these same cognitive structures where everything, whether it's friendship or love or money um, was limited, was fixed and limited. Um, and so it, that influences the way that their, their society and their relationships um, engage with each other. And so when I talk about privileged peasant mindset, what I'm talking about is that similar mindset, um, but within a situation where now your, your membership with a group within a society gives you a situational advantage. Um, so those people are experiencing both um, both entitlement beliefs and scarcity beliefs together. And I, my assumption, I haven't tested this yet, and that's what I'm hoping to do during a PhD, but my assumption is that uh, when you have uh, high levels of both of these things interacting, it increases um, the negative consequences from it. But the, the interesting thing is that um, it tends to be, entitlement beliefs tend to be applied by people that are not at the bottom of their group, their in-group. It's generally people that are a little bit higher. Um, or n just not at the bottom. And it's because they want to protect that advantage um, that they have. And so I don't, I don't know if that kind of ex explains that contextually. I don't, I don't think you have to have both entitlement and scarcity beliefs to resent Black Lives Matter. I think you can have just entitlement beliefs, um, but together I think it makes it a little bit worse. Um, and also in having higher entitlement beliefs also, or a higher belief in zero sum game increases your perception of scarcity too, whether it's true or not. Great, so, thank you so much, Jameson, for answering. And thank you, Rebecca, for your great question. We just have another couple minutes left and I wanna see if Jacob or Tan has a question. I'm not sure if Tan's still here before we- No, I really like the, uh, I was interested to hear the responses that were given to the past questions. So. Great, thank you. Yeah, I thought it was a great presentation, great information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. And Christopher, I'm so glad you came through to the other on the other side of this. Uh, um, did you did you say you you had COVID? Did you yes, say that? Uh, oh positive. wow! I'm yeah. I'm so happy you're you're healthy. You're getting healthy. <laughs> so thank you. We're hoping it's over because it's uh, it's not been a fun two weeks. Wow. <laughs> well, you consider yourself lucky, right? Yeah. Well, we're glad we're glad to have you here, despite your cough. We hope that you are able to get better in time for the holidays with your family. Hoping so too. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for coming. We really appreciate everyone's contributions. It's um, it's a great conference, and as you can see, every session is full of really interesting topics and brilliant thoughts from presenters and participants alike. So thank you all for being part of this today. And you can look for a recording of this on the PGSA website if you'd like to, um, to have a copy for your, own, for your own records. So thank you again for coming and we hope to see you at a subsequent session. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everyone. bye.